Welcome, everybody, to another episode of UFO Man Live. Uh, before we introduce our subject for this evening, we're going to introduce our panel, starting with Tommy Highway. Hey, folks, I'm Tommy Highway. I'm a network engineer. I'm an author. I'm a ufologist, and I'm really happy to be here. want to thank everybody for coming out, as always. And Tim, my brother, thank you for having me. Not a problem. Thomas. Hey, Tim, uh, UFO Man. Thanks for having me today. I'm, uh, I'm Thomas. I'm a uh, software engineer. Uh, UFO, uh, ufologist, ancient alien theorist, CE5 meditation specialist, and I think this UFO is rock. Okay, I, I don't know who it is, but somebody has a TV playing in the background. Could be me. Let me see. Okay. Yeah, it was you. Um, all right, going on. Um, tonight we're going to be discussing the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, we have some new information that is going to come out about the Skinwalker Ranch. At least we think it's new information. Um, there's a lot of phenomena and sightings of UFOs, creatures, Bigfoot, large dogs, everything you can think of at Skinwalker. And Mr. Tommy Highway... Mm -hmm has a summary to tell you. That's right, Tim, I do. Um, folks, th there's a ranch in Utah with the name The Skinwalker, whose history is just about as creepy as its name. Um, it's been rumored that it's an uh, it's, uh, Indian thing, you know, Native American thing, that sort of that sort of deal at burial grounds, perhaps, who knows. But for over two centuries, it has been <laughs> the, ep the epicenter of countless paranormal and UFO phenomena. It has been the site of a secret UFO study, partially funded by the Pentagon of all places, and is mentioned in the folklore of Native American Navajo tribe, supposedly the home of the sinister shape-shifting wolf, the Skinwalker. So, in other words, the Skinwalker is basically a Native American legend, essentially, and apparently um, it's caused a phenomenon in this particular area, this ranch, right? Now, a team of researchers and scientists have been granted access to the ranch, one of the most infamous and secretive hot spots of paranormal and UFO related activities on Earth, to capture their investigation on film for the very first time. Now, Sky History spoke to the entrepreneur Brandon Fugel, Skinwalker's current owner, who is funding in the current investigation, and to Dr. Travis Taylor, who brings his wealth of scientific knowledge gained in the fields of engineering and aerospace systems to the investigation. So, in other words, they brought some pretty heavy hitting people in here. These people are not right. uh, your average, you know, uh, idiot off the street. I mean, these are we're talking PhDs or better, right? Now, unlike the other areas of, of in, in America uh, famous for UFO activity, such as Area 51, there have been strange sightings on the Skinwalker Ranch for more than 200 years. Can you give some background on the story of the occurrences in the Skinwalker Ranch? And this is a uh, Brandon Fugel. Uh, they're interviewing him, basically. A uh, Fugel, I guess Fugel, I think it is. Uh, yeah. This is and not this is not a contemporary phenomenon. This is something that has been occurring for generations. He goes on to say that the Native American tribes in the area have spoken for generations of strange occurrences of lights in the sky and unexplained phenomena in the area. Over the course of the last few decades, we've seen events occur with greater frequency, and for some reason, the specific property appears to be the center of gravity for a diversity of unexplained phenomena. 
ranging from the unidentified flying objects to cattle mutilations to orbs appearing and some troubling electromagnetic anomalies that lead or that led to equipment failures and also to acute medical episodes. In other words, there have been things that have happened on the ranch that have affected equipment, electronics, and even the people themselves with health conditions and things of that nature. And this is, again, this is kind of a known thing with the, uh, the legend of the skinwalker. Um, to go on, people have been seriously harmed. Several of my team members have had to go to the hospital with injuries that still defy any conventional explanation. And, and you know, we take these incidents very seriously. It's important to note that it is da a very dangerous place. Anyone who enters the perimeter of the property is required to sign a liability waiver. Think about that. Wow, I mean, yeah. you, may, you may be messed up by unknown forces. You better sign here. That's pretty severe. Yeah. Um, they have to acknowledge that the risk associated with being involved with the subject in the property. I mean, my goodness. So uh, then it goes on to the continued interview. And um, the sky history says, Brandon, you are Brandon. Your background is in property on the paper and the ranch does not look like the good investment with it, with its history and UFO sightings, cattle mutilation, unexplained phenomena. Why did, what makes you want to purchase it? And he goes on to say, I see purchasing the Skinwalker Ranch as a scientific endeavor and not one that would provide meaningful return on investment. In other words, he purchased the place specifically to do research on this. And thank right. goodness that he did because somebody really needed to. I mean, it's been passed around from family to family, things like that. And people don't, you know, they don't want to expose themselves to this kind of potential ridicule, things of that nature. But this guy bought it specifically to do that. So that stuff's out the window. Uh, it has blown my mind, he goes on to say. Owning this property has completely changed my perspective. It has opened my mind to the possibility that we are truly not alone in the universe and that there are more than meets the eye to our existence on this planet. And, and I find that a very inspiring endeavor. We are excited to be able to be invite the public to, on your journey to accompany the, uh, to, I'm sorry, to accompany us as we delve into these topics. So the guy goes on to say that, um, well, I'm sorry that the sky asked him again, Dr. Taylor, they get to, to Dr. Taylor's point, Dr. Taylor, what is your involvement in the Skinwalker Ranch? And uh, did you have any perspective on UFOs and the paranormal before joining this project? He goes on to say, I've always been skeptical of 99.9% .9 of paranormal and UFO reports because a lot of witnesses accounts do not provide specific, uh, scientifically valid data, which is true. They are not reputable, and there's usually no specific uh, scientific instrumentation to back up uh, back them up whatsoever. The eyewitness's testimony, maybe. Um, many times, the eyewitness has mis misconstrued or misunderstood what, they, what he or she was seeing. Even fighter pilots and astronauts sometimes get it wrong. So, I mean, I'm sure that that happens, you know. Um, right. But then again, when you're talking about specifically fighter pilots, these guys have hundreds, if not thousands, and maybe even tens of thousands of hours in the air. They've seen every kind of aerial phenomenon there is out there. So right. to call those guys out to say that maybe they're getting it wrong, you know, they, they're not mistaking a weather balloon or a glint of light off the off of, of ice crystals or something. They know what they're looking at. Right. Um, OK. And so uh, he went on to say um this is very he's very skeptical thinking that we are going to find some phenomena like hallucinogenic plant or some natural phenomenon that is causing the confusion or there's a government base nearby that people don't understand what they're seeing so in other words he's looking at things like local foliage and whatever it could be some sort of uh hallucinogenic properties or whatever i don't know i mean there have been too many specific stories coming out of this place for you know for it to be hallucinations in my opinion yeah um, right. then he, then too he many credible up. people too who have worked at the location over oh, the years. Sure. sure, absolutely. I mean, families have witnessed things. Entire families have, have come forward with stories about this place, uh, but we'll get yeah. into that later. Um, he says he goes on to say that he doesn't like the does not like the term paranormal. I like the Brandon's way of putting it: high strangeness, which is much better because paranormal suggests that there's something that can't be explained without supernatural explanations. And I think that eventually someday we'll be able to explain what's going on at the Skidmore Ranch, even if it turns out to be from another universe or another dimension or something from outer space or just something natural, weird phenomena that Mother Nature is surprising us with. So, right. I mean, it sounds like he's going at it logically. He's going at it with uh, a level of skepticism. And, you know, as everybody that's been watching the channel forever knows, I tend to look at it that way myself. I mean, yeah. someone comes to me and says, hey, I've seen a UFO. Well, I need the who, what, where, when, and why. And then I'll decide whether or not I think you're credible, right? Yeah. 
But if I may, Tommy, if I may add to this, uh, back in 2005, when I was working with uh, Colonel John Alexander, retired at the time, um, he was uh, he had he you know at his house, he basically talked about the uh, you know the stuff that was going on at Skinwalker that he, along with Robert Bigelow from Bigelow Aerospace, um, and uh, Bert Rattan from from uh, an, another aerospace person who was working with it. They were all on the ranch observing, seeing what was going on. There was a, a Bigelow bought the ranch in '96 after finding out what was going on, and after being tipped off by Alexander and Hal Putoff, who was one of the top known uh, remote viewers at the time for what was going on at that particular location. Uh, Bigelow bought the ranch, and as part of the National Institute for Discovery Science (NDIS), they were on that ranch for a period of time doing really scientific with really high-end equipment observations of what was going on. And they, at, at the one time, there's the one legend of the, the guys up on a ridge looking down with binoculars and seeing stuff. And then literally they he talked about seeing that an energy portal opened up right in front of everybody and was there bright as could be. And this creature freaking crawled out of it and ran off into the woods. I mean, this is coming from one of, you know, a retired army colonel who's been heavily involved in uh, the Stanford Research Institute into a lot of different stuff. And if you want to call it psyops and, right. and different types of stuff throughout the years. And, you know, very credible person talking about specifically what he saw. And this is before, you know, Skinwalker was ever kind of known for his stuff. But it's just something that I've known for a long time. And if they, in the, and, as time has gone on and people have gone and talked about and brought more out about it, Everything that John brought forward to me at that time is 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 the truth. It's proving to be true. Yeah, uh, that ties into the uh, uh, giant dog story, right, Tommy? It actually does. Um, a, a family purchased the Skinwalker Ranch, and this has been many years ago. But they purchased the ranch, and as they're moving, literally moving in their their stuff, um, they've got a bunch of cattle that they brought with them, and they've got like a family, a couple little kids, wife, that sort of thing. And uh, they noticed, they looked up on the ridge and they saw a, a giant dog. It looked like a big wolf or something. And as they observed it, it began to walk toward them. And it walked down toward the family. And it was very friendly, uh, big, very big, but very friendly. They, they were able to pet it and interact with it and all of that. Well, as they were doing this, apparently one of the calves that they brought with them, one of the you know, baby cows, stuck its nose through like a fence. And this dog immediately grabbed it and started killing it i mean it's shaking it and all this and the calf is screaming and there's blood everywhere and they start beating this dog thing with clubs and rocks and things like that nothing phased it so then the father goes into the house and pulls out a 357 magnum now that's a very serious caliber handgun i own one myself and shot this thing several times and then finally after four or five shots it finally blew some fur off this thing and it dropped the calf that was dead out dead and just walked casually walked away and it, as it walked away it it um they followed the tracks later and the tracks just dead ended and went into nowhere. Okay. In the middle of a field, in the middle of a field. I mean, this thing took several shots with a 357 Magnum to its back and it barely phased it. I mean, what could do that? So it seems like perhaps that portal Thomas was talking about may have opened up and it may have disappeared into the portal. So it could have been the same creature that crawled out and ran off into the woods because there are reports of creatures in the woods roaring, actual roaring sounds mm -hmm. and and uh, growling. Now, who knows? Maybe that's attributed to Bigfoot too, because there's been a lot of Bigfoot sightings in and around Skinwalker, yeah. along with UFOs and lights and yeah. creatures of all different kinds. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the uh, uh, triangle up in uh, Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, can't think of the name of it, but uh, they have the same type of phenomena. Yeah. Um, but even you're saying about UFOs, Tim, they're really quick. The AATIP, the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program that was run at the Pentagon, started going and in, in, uh, conducting studies at Skinwalker in 2007. So, yeah, there are sightings there and they are credible because if it brings out the bigwigs from uh, the Pentagon and they're there to do, you know, some deep investigations, there's right. they, they were looking. Yeah. Well, someone saw stuff and they had enough credible people there to say this shit's real. I do have three overlays I'm going to bring up uh, that are actual photographs of UFOs right. that, that were photographed over Skinwalker. Here's one, it's quite famous, of a cigar-shape above the ridge 
This actually is a, an authentic and verified photograph from Skinwalker Ranch. Here's another one. This is over Skinwalker. Yeah. Over the ridge, actually. Interesting and shape. This is over Skinwalker. This almost looks like a disc with like maybe a dome on top. I don't know. It's just weird looking. Or, also, something, or it has something going off to the side and to the back almost, kind of like that traditional tic-tac shape where they'll show it where the tic-tac is there, and it's got right. that little kind of a thing on it. Right. And then on the TV series, they showed you this, which was the hill glowing and a beam of light going up from the ridge into the sky. Mm -hmm. Okay. They also have the phenomena where there are lights like this, orbs that gather at the top of the ridge, they come on, and then when you approach them, they blink off, or they shoot straight up into the sky. They've also recorded this shot, which is a blue light over Skinwalker. And then here's this one. This is some lights. You can kind of see a darkness to the right, and we're, we're not sure. We talked about this before the stream, and it's either trees or maybe the ridge. Uh, these lights are suspended above the ground. They're supposedly UFO lights uh, at Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, here's an aerial photo shot. shot of Skinwalker, you can see the one main road going into the ranch, the main ranch house. There's a building here, a building back there, and then you've got this field with the sparse trees in front of it. That, that has activity, but the one behind the house is where the dog disappeared. Mm -hmm. This one behind the house. So, um, yeah, and this is some news reports I want to put up. UFOs cause stir in Uintah Basin skies. Uintah Basin is where the Skinwalker Ranch is located in Utah. Um, they actually believe that there might be a curse that was placed on the land that the Skinwalker Ranch lies on due to the tribe known as the Utes. Um, or the Navajo. Ranch family terrorized by unknown forces. The ranch family that originally owned the house were, the, were known as the Shermans. Um, in, the interview, in the presentation I'm going to show you tonight with George Knapp, he, re, he refers to them as the Gormans, but it's actually the Sherman family, and you can easily Google that online if you want to get more information about it but it says the local farming family has been reporting mysterious incidents occurring on their farm recently but many think this is a cry wolf situation after the dis disappearance of their 10 year old boy last week the boy's father has made calls to the police almost daily reporting strange incidents such as wolf tracks all over his property so that ties into the wolf dog theory as well. And then we got a farmer, local farmer, claims to have seen portals. So Thomas, this backs up your claim in your story about a portal opening. This is a local farmer, and this was, uh, if I'm correct, this was like in the 70s. So that's way yeah. before... Uh, the incident occurred yeah. with you talking to John Alexander. That yeah, and the thing about these portals we have to remember is they're two way. They come in, they go away, they finish their stuff, they go back. That's my point. So when yeah. Tommy was telling the dog story, and it ended up in an empty field, and the foot track, the footprint stopped. Obviously, it must have gone through something. Yeah. How we can prove that, I don't know. We probably have to see it happen and get it on film or something. But uh, yeah, that's very indicative. Now, um, they say there's a lot of Bigfoot around the area. This is one oops, This is one supposedly climbing a ledge. Now, Tommy thought it might be what, Tommy? I thought it might be that big dog. If you look at that, that upper photo right there, 
um, it could be that large animal. Yeah, it very well could be. Yeah, um, they, they said it was big. They said it was like a really, really big dog, um, which I'm really surprised that the guy, to be honest with you, even let it get around his family. But I, I guess it happened so fast that maybe he didn't time to react. But again, they said it was friendly at first. Yeah, right. Apparently then, like beef. Something like this was also seen. Now, this is more upright. Yeah. Uh, this was verified as a Bigfoot sighting. And these two here that were filmed at Skinwalker were said to have been Bigfoot. Uh, one in front and one in back. You can kind of see the arm bent to the right. Yeah. Um, you can make and, out a head, a torso, an arm, you know, a, a right. and stuff. Yeah, it's clear. Right. That's kind of what they were insinuating it might be. Now, with all the phenomena that's going on at Skinwalker, it's still unproven to this day as to what is causing all of it. Um, the tribal leaders of the Ute Nation and the Navajo Nation in the area were approached with the theory that there was a curse on the land, and they said, no, no such curse has been placed on the land. So if that's the case, either they don't have the knowledge of a curse, or there isn't one and something else is causing the phenomenon. This, yeah, this is some kind of magnetic anomaly or phenomenon that's en enabling this kind of stuff to go ahead and, and take place. Because just and there's just too much for throughout all the years to go ahead and just discount and say it's not real. What about the people that reported the voices? What about that story? People that were walking through the field and they'd hear voices, they couldn't determine where they were coming from, but they were close, and they would, you know, they would call out to them and these voices would start like basically laughing at them. Yeah. yeah, like they can see them, but we can't see them. Right, right. but they were—it's like they're right on top of them, though. Was what was so weird about it? Um, right. I've also heard that at the ranch, uh, there are instances where time has been sped up or slowed mm -hmm. down, or now, even stopped. There was another point uh, that George Knapp made, which was a pen full of. I think it was two or three prize bulls, and we're talking Simmental bulls, really big, heavy, muscular bulls, okay? We're in their pen at one point. There was a commotion. They went out to the pen to check on them. They weren't there. Uh, they went looking for them. Later, they were found crammed in a pen that was too small for holding their size, so they were crammed in really tight. So how did they get into this other pen? It, the, things are being moved around. Mm -hmm. Things are being, uh, uh, cattle are being dismembered, uh, cored out. Um, animals are being harassed. People are getting sick. The whole place is a very scary place. Right. Okay. Anybody got any last comments before we go to uh, the video clip? Yeah, if I could, Tim, just follow one, one, one more small little thing. When sure. I was talking to Alexander, one of the important things that he talked about and really emphasized was that there is something screwing with time and screwing with the people there. So it's not just you know, this giant dog thing coming and stuff coming out of it, there's an intelligence to it. There's a bunch of stuff that goes along with it. And one of the times they had one camera set up uh, with another one with a, you know, basically pointing at the other camera and this particular camera all of a sudden goes out and the, the, the cows stir a little bit and everything. And they've got a video feed going right at that particular location the entire time. Right. They went out there and they checked out the, the camera, which had basically had the, the video cable going up at, inside of a cast iron pipe. And a big section of the cable was just cut out of the center of the cable inside of it. Yet it was there and it was working and then it stopped and we had the video feed going and there's no evidence of anything happened. So yes, they are they are dealing with, you know, time manipulation. Right. And actually spatial manipulation if they're if they're removing things in our in our etheric space. So yeah, that's very interesting. Exactly. Tommy, just too much 
just too much going on there for there to be nothing happening. There's just way too much going on. There's way too many stories from way too many people. And these are people that don't want attention. I mean, we've never heard their names before. They're not out there talking to the media, talking to the National Enquirer. They're not doing any of that. But they are reporting very secretly their stories and their experiences of the Skinwalker Ranch. And I just think there's too much going on there to, to dismiss this thing. I really do. Right. Um, what I want to say is if it's happening on the ranch, is it happening outside the ranch in the general vicinity? Where's the boundary? Why is it only happening in the ranch? Yeah, is there a boundary? Mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like there, there might be, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, what, concentration. What, what is keeping the boundary closed to where it doesn't expand outside the ranch? Is it geologic? Is it something to deal with the magnetic field of the right. earth and bringing this kind of stuff in? What makes that particular little piece of ground so much different than every other place on this planet? What makes yeah. that different? Although there is another farm, uh, there's another farm where they're having a lot of ET activity and uh, Bigfoot activity, and I can't remember what state. I, I think it's in Arizona, but I'm not sure. But we'll do that on another live stream, and we'll approach that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think uh, Thomas has a point that it might be the geomagnetics of that ridge, maybe, because that ridge is really close to the house, and that yeah. seems to be where all the a lot of the activity begins is mm -hmm. up on the ridge and near the near the actual dwellings. Yeah. So I don't know, but let's see. Let's get the film going here. This is George Knapp. He's going to be talking about. Skinwalker Ranch. He's also going to be bringing up some photographs. Uh, I guess he had video footage and it got screwed up before he got there. So we'll uh, just take a look at it, see what he says. Okay. Go. Here we go. Tonight I am going to talk about Skinwalker Ranch a bit. Some of you may have read the book. Uh, for those of you who have, uh, some of these stories will not be new, but I, I might be able to put a new perspective on them. Uh, I brought along a, a pile of video, and we're going to see a variety of things, but not the things that I originally planned. Uh, last night, before I left Las Vegas, I had my, my uh, photographer re-edit this video, so I have nice new stuff to show you, and it, he put it on a disc that does not play. So... Um, uh, so we're going to have some still photos so I can show you what the ranch looks like. And then you're going to hear from some of the key players who sort of put the whole study of the Skinwalker Ranch together. In fact, we're going to start with that right now. I want to uh, show you um, some comments from a guy named Bob Bigelow. And as mentioned in the introduction, Bob is a Las Vegas businessman. He's probably worth, I, I don't want to embarrass him by saying it, but it's a lot of money. Anyway, Bob Bigelow is a, is a very wealthy man with interests in the kind of topics that you and I are interested in. And he uh, created something called NIDS, the National Institute for Discovery Science, several years ago, uh, accumulated a group of um, yeah. world-class scientists, uh, military people, intelligence people, into a science advisory board. He created uh, an organization that was sort of like a a uh, strike force, a Delta Force team, that whenever something weird happened, a cattle mutilation, a UFO incident, he could send these guys out, put them on a private jet, and, and go there with a bunch of equipment and see if they could uh, figure out what had happened, to analyze, to do what science should have been doing with these kinds of mysteries all, all along. Um, anyway, he's the guy who, and I'll explain all the details coming up, but he's the guy who bought Skinwalker Ranch. This ranch, as, as we will learn, has been the site of uh, really strange, incredible things for as long as anyone can remember. And when Bob heard about it, he bought it. And so we're going to hear from him now. And it's sort of like this is starting at the end because uh, Bob is uh, he doesn't like to give interviews. In fact, this was the first on camera interview he ever gave. And I think the only uh, camera uh, on camera interview he's ever going to give on this particular topic of the ranch and he's sort of uh summing up what he and his team were able to accomplish at the ranch in in tracing down all these mysteries uh something that took seven eight years go ahead and play it the performances didn't repeat themselves and you know each time there would be a performance of a sort uh there was always some unique pattern it was something that that was always changed so we would be prepared 
that if this thing, this, this type of event happened again, we know what to do. Well, that exact same event never happened again. It would always be something completely different. We were always outguessed. Every time we, we would uh, come up with uh, some method of uh, observation or calibration that uh, we were always outguessed as to what yeah, was I bet going, they were. Know, how we were going. And so it, it became obvious that <clears throat> we obviously weren't the ones in control. We were along for the ride. And that a lot of these ex exhibitions were exhibitions for gamesmanship or instruction, um, you know, in, in that kind of context. The phenomena was playing with us and um, giving us only a taste here and there of various things, an opportunity to see things that were abnormal. Uh, opportunity to cause examinations upon performances of things that were very unique through certain pathological kinds of investigations. And those were opportunities that were very helpful. Um, the, so, and, and so in terms of witnessing things, we witnessed things both on camera and in person yeah. that um, we were privileged to witness, that we, we could have uh, easily not had any opportunities. If the, if the phenomena did not want us to observe anything, then we wouldn't have observed anything. Um, here is science and the scientists yeah. need to do what they should be doing, going out in the field and evaluating evidence. But in this case, and I mentioned that the subtitle of the book is Science Confronts the Unknown or the Paranormal. Science got its butt kicked. Um, yeah. I bet it did. Which, which suggests that maybe science is not the only framework with which we can evaluate some of these events that you and I are all interested in. And I'll give you an example. And it comes from day one at Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, this family moves into this property. That's a 480-acre ranch. It's a beautiful property in northeastern Utah. The family consists, we call mm -hmm. them Mormons in the book. That's not their real name. Um, talking about. And, and we left out the We're name. We're talking about the Shermans. Um, yeah. At their request. Yeah. But the name has been, the real names have been printed in, in newspaper articles, so anybody who wanted to find them could. Anyway, day one, they buy this ranch. It's going to be their dream property, their dream home. They're there at the property unloading their, their uh, possessions, and they look out across this green pasture, and there's a big animal uh, lurking up by the tree line. What the heck is that? And it, it looks like a, is it a big dog? Uh, no, it looks like a wolf, they figured out. And then it starts moving towards them, kind of in a zigzag motion. And they're wondering, God, we didn't even know there were wolves in this area. And then they thought, well, gosh, it's coming right towards us. It must be domesticated. It must be somebody's pet. It gets, this thing gets within about 10 feet of, a, of the family. It had rained that day. And they remember when they told this story later that they could smell the wet dog smell. There's this wolf coming up towards them. That they're all, all sort of on guard a little bit. It is a big, I mean, it's gigantic. It, and it, in essence, comes up, it would come up to like the middle of my chest. It's back, huge, heavily muscled, gigantic, um, powerful. So it's walking in between the family, being kind of docile, uh, not presenting kind of any kind of a threat. The family had just unloaded some calves into this corral that's in the, uh, in the ranch area right near the home. And this wolf sees one of these calves, these unfortunate calves that made the bad uh, judgment to stick its nose out the bars of the corral. The wolf springs like 15 feet in the air, chomps down its powerful jaws on this on the snout of this calf that had stuck its its head through the bars and starts pulling it. Well, the calf is bleeding, it's screaming. Uh, the everybody in the family is upset. The dad, the rancher, jumps and grabs a big axe handle, and um, and beats this wolf on the back with all of his might. He hits it a couple of times. The wolf doesn't blink. He sends his kid to uh, his truck. He has a powerful handgun in the, a 357 in his uh, glove box. The kid brings it back. He tells his family to stand, stand back. Boom, shoots this wolf point blank. A second time, a third time, it's not moving. Now, by this time, the, uh, the calf is fading. It looks like it's going to die. The family's freaked out that this, this wolf is apparently bulletproof. The, ga the dad sends his father into the house, get, comes out with a hunting rifle, a powerful gun that's been used to take down uh, elk and, and much larger animals than this wolf. 
and again, he pumps a, a round point blank into the wolf uh, from this rifle. The wolf doesn't scream, doesn't bleed, doesn't do anything. He just he dr does drop the calf and just stands there and looks at the rancher with his, with his rifle. So he shoots him another time. He, the, the wolf walks a couple of feet away. He shoots him again, and a big chunk of flesh, flesh and, and fur, flies off the wolf and lands in the grass. The wolf calmly turns around and trots slowly back across the pasture from whence it had came. Everybody's looking at each other going, what the hell was this about? Um, they decide uh, you can't have a, a wolf that big and that powerful with five bullet holes in it and just let it roam on your property. So they grabbed another gun and go after it. And they're tracking it across the pasture. And, and on the other side of this pasture on the ranch is uh, this streamy area, a marshy streamy area. It's got a stream that runs pretty much year round. There's a lot of mud there and, and thick brush. While they're going through the thick brush, uh, the father and his son, following the tracks they have no trouble following these tracks because the wolf is so heavy that it was sinking two three inches into the ground they're following the tracks and they occasionally get a glimpse glimpse of the of the wolf as they're going through and then they come to this clearing and the tracks go right out in the middle of the clearing and it's like 30 feet on both sides uh to these trees and there's water in the other direction and the tracks get to the middle of this mud bog and just stop and they're gone as poof, this thing had just been sucked up or pulled up into the air or disappeared. The father and son are looking at each other. Uh, they don't know what to do. They, they walk back to the house kind of in silence. They find the chunk of flesh and fur that had been uh, expelled by that last shot. And the dad picks it up and it smells like rotten meat, like it's been out in the sun for a couple of hours. They uh, basically agreed that they weren't going to talk about that anymore. Because uh, there they are, they've moved into their new dream home, and it's this kind of weirdness hit them on the very first day, day one on Skinwalker Ranch. Um, I don't expect any of you to believe everything that you're going to hear tonight, because some of this is really weird. Yeah, um, but we should. Any of it, yeah. or all of you to believe any of it, but, um, but I'm going to tell you how the stories uh, were told to me by both the, the people who lived on the ranch by the people who own the ranch, by the people who live all around it in this in this area, and, and by the NID scientists who risk their their lives, their very lives, to try to track it down. Uh, this uh, this is really a two stories tonight. One is about the ranch itself, which, as I mentioned, had been the site of unusual activity for as long as anyone can remember. And the second story is about a scientific adventure, uh, a, an attempt by legitimate credentialed scientists to investigate the unknown, uh, something that the science establishment, as you and I know, does its best to avoid. Uh, the study that was undertaken was not perfect, uh, but it was remarkable and probably represents the most intense study of an individual paranormal hotspot in the history of the world. Uh, the private sector, uh, anyway, uh, we don't know what the military has done. Uh, the risks for the research team were very real. Uh, dangerous not only from a professional standpoint, uh, because if the word got out that they're working on weirdness like this, they could they'd, they'd never get another legitimate job. But also, it was dangerous physically because this thing, this entity, this intelligence, whatever it was or is, uh, demonstrated that it, it exerted control over mind and matter in ways that we simply don't understand. It has the ability to manipulate people animals, technology, and maybe space and time. It demonstrated an ability to kill, to dismember, and to terrorize. And it seemingly fed on the fear uh, that its actions generated. And it's tempting to go ahead and call it evil. And a lot of people have written to me, it must be evil, it must be Satan or something like that. Uh, it is tempting to call it evil because some of the things that it did seem evil, but uh, you know, evil's kind of in the eye of the beholder. My guess is that it's a mistake to assign human motives to something that certainly doesn't seem to be human at all. And that fits the bill here. Uh, you know, Dr. Jacques Vallée, as I told you, he told me that he was going to be greatly disappointed if it turns out the answer to the UFO mystery is merely people from other planets visiting us, uh, that they might be extraterrestrials, but that might be only be part of the story. Uh, and I think that there are hints that it is far more mysterious and confusing 
and maybe more wondrous of an explanation. And I, I tend to agree with that. And here's why. There's this ranch in Utah. We can show some of the pictures, not this one from the, the stills. Maybe we show it for a little while and just run them randomly. This would be a point where I'm, I would be showing you my video, but as I mentioned, it's, uh, the disc is not, not, help, not being helpful. It's a beautiful ranch, 480 acres, well watered. Right up here on this side is uh, what's known as Skinwalker Ridge. And there are three homesteads that, uh, that make up this ranch. That's the first one. That's the house where the ranching family lived. Uh, there's another, if, if we had panned with video wise, which we don't have, there's another homestead here and then a third one that make up the whole property. Uh, it is a beautiful place. Uh, there's only one road leading into it. That becomes significant in a lot of ways. Uh, the road leads to a locked gate uh, and it's got these ominous keep out signs, always has had them there to deter trespassers. It is private property, but uh, ever since the story of Skinwalker Ranch got out, and I guess that's my fault, um, a lot of curious people have been trespassing and doing all kinds of crazy things there. As mentioned, this 480 acres previously divided into three homesteads. Uh, the first building, principal residence, where a lot of very, very strange things happened. Uh, from the, the vantage point of the house, you can see these wide pastures and the tree lines, and, and uh, that distance over there on the right hand side that would have been where the wolf came from if you're wondering um back down by the first homestead there's this metal corral i don't you want to try another shot that's an observation post that the nids guys built they had dogs inside this is uh this is a shot of the property from skinwalker ridge that's the uh, second and third homesteads where a lot of very strange things happened that's an old, uh, old building that left on the property, kind of spooky, especially when you're creeping around in there at night. This is a symbol, uh, a Masonic symbol that was left on the property. Uh, it's sort of a little side story. And, and like I said, this legend has it all, but this town, this part of Utah uh, was where two companies of the Buffalo soldiers were uh, stationed um, yep. at the turn of the century. And it turns out that all these guys were Masons. They were Freemasons. So at some point, these Buffalo soldiers who were there to keep the peace and, and to uh, after the creation of the Indian reservation, the Ute reservation that surrounds the Skinwalker Ranch, they came on the property at some point. And I, I think that's our guess because this thing was more than 100 years old. That's Colm Kelleher, my co-author on the side over there. And, and this is Keith Wolverton. He's a deputy sheriff from uh, Montana who had studied a series of mutilations and UFO sightings and Bigfoot incidents in his um, is this video on this, this part, you know, they brought in the big guns. Yeah. Okay. I actually have a video of him okay, talking that's, that's about the ranch mutilation. house. Um, the first day that the, the stop for a second. Um, the first day that ranch house, when they moved in, it was uh, kind of dilapidated. The property had been empty for seven years when the people bought it. Uh, they didn't know much about the, the legends that surrounded the property. No one had bothered to tell them. When they got into the house, they noticed a couple of, couple of strange things. On both uh, doors, were the, uh, the two entrances to the house, there was these giant stakes with great big heavy chains, as if they'd had guard dogs, whoever the last residence where they'd had these big heavy guard dogs there uh, at both doors. They also noticed that there were bolts on both sides of the doors, all inside in the interior of the house, as well as everything was bolted. Everywhere it was bolted and, and latched down as if uh, somebody was trying to keep something out or as if uh, they wanted to keep things sort of bolted down. You can go to the next picture. Let's see what it is. That's the uh, spooky keep outside. I can't believe it's still there, by the way. Hard to believe somebody hasn't stolen it. That's uh, a neighbor who... Uh, is cruising down the road from his property going into the ranch. He, uh, he's been there uh, even longer than the Gorman family, and we interviewed him as well. And we'll call him Mr. Gonzalez, but he has got quite a few stories of his own as well. Uh, that will hold on this for a second, because uh, we'll come back and tell you about a story. That, that white, this is the corral, and that, that white uh, metallic trailer is the scene of one of the strangest incidents that happened to the family. I'll jump ahead out of order a little bit uh, because some weird things began happening to the, the family's animals after uh, 
uh, a number of other strange activity, paranormal type act or poltergeist type activity. Uh, they have four, the, the animals started disappearing. They lost a total of 14 head. Uh, a couple of them were mutilated. Uh, a couple of them just disappeared. The tracks would go out into the snow and just poof, it was gone. And so the rancher says to his wife, um, as they're driving past this, this uh, corral going to town to do some shopping, we've got these four prize bulls. They raise these, uh, these cattle called Semental, high-end, uh, hybrid cattle, very expensive. He says, if something happens to our four bulls, we'll go under. We're done. And uh, these things were 2,000 pounds each, big, heavy, mean, strong animals, and they're all in this corral. Rancher and his wife come back uh, half an hour later from town. All four bulls are gone. Uh, they're in a panic. They're run, running around, looking around. Who could have come onto the property? What the heck happened here? Uh, just on a whim, the rancher stands up on, on uh, something like a box, peers up into the, into the corral, the metal corral, the doors of which are wired shut. And there's all four bulls inside that somebody had crammed them in there. They're all crammed up against each other like this. Uh, how you would get one bull in there is a mystery. How you got all four of them in there boggles the mind. It just can't be done. There's no way to do it. Uh, these The bulls, uh, the rancher yells to his wife, hey, they're in here. And the, the bulls had been in like a trance um, out of it. And as soon as he yelled, they woke up and started kicking the hell out of the inside of this thing here. Uh, just another little mystery um, that, that has yet to be, be explained. The whole area, the Uinta Basin, has been the site of strange stuff forever. Um, there were Spanish explorers, Father Escalante, who came through there in the late 1700s. They had what sounds like a UFO flying over their, their campfire. Um, Native Americans have been there for hundreds of years. Uh, they have reported the same kinds of things, what we would call UFOs, what we would call Bigfoot, uh, Sasquatch, they call skinwalkers. And I'm not going to go into a whole big explanation about what skinwalkers are or Native American beliefs, um, but it, it turns out that in this whole vast Uinta Basin, uh, people, 80, 90 percent of the people who lived there had seen UFOs, uh, poltergeists, paranormal stuff. Uh, a guy named Dr. Frank Salisbury uh, wrote a book about it uh, called uh, The Utah UFO Display. And the word display, I think, is kind of key because it kind of goes back to what Bob Bigelow told us about a performance. Dr. Salisbury, a university professor, sort of reached the same conclusion. But what has been happening for a very long time in the Uinta Basin is a display. But for our benefit, they show us glimpses when they want to show us glimpses. They let us see bits and pieces, but it's always by their rules. We only get to see what they decide we're allowed to see. Uh, this book uh, that Dr. Salisbury wrote was based on about 400 of the best UFO cases that had been compiled by a guy named uh, Junior Hicks, who was a school teacher in the Uinta Basin. He basically had been there forever. So all everybody in town um, had, had gone through his science classes. Everybody knew him. Everybody trusted him. So as these UFO things would happen, he became the uh, unofficial UFO historian for the whole basin. And all the best cases, all the incidents would all come uh, his way. So he started investigating them. And those cases of his that were very well documented formed the basis of that book. Uh, we got to meet Junior Hicks and talk to him about some of the things he had seen over the years. And as we're doing it, he mentioned that in all the vast Uinta Basin, which seemed to be a UFO paranormal hotspot for as long as anyone could remember, there was one spot in particular that seemed to be the epicenter of the activity and that was this ranch and uh, he called it skinwalker ranch he said it was uh, the, the name came because it is in the path of the skinwalker according to the utes uh and I, I remember getting just sort of a little chill on my arm when he told me about it uh skinwalker in case you don't know in native american lore is a shapeshifter a sorcerer an evil witch uh, can control men's minds and, and make them do all kinds of things. It uh, assumes the shape of animals, uh, puts on the skins, and then it has the power of those animals. And although we might find it uh, quaint or, or stick it in a religious category, it's very serious stuff to Native Americans. And in fact, in trying to do research for this book, it was uh, pretty much impossible to find anyone who was willing to talk about it.
and I'm serious about it, even at, at universities and things of that sort. Trying to get anyone to talk about it was, was very, very difficult uh, because they figure that uh, if you mention a skinwalker, it comes for you. Yeah, if it gets your attention, uh, you're going to regret it. Why this relates to our discussion, um, and I won't give you too much of a history lesson, but back in the day, uh, 200 years ago, the Utes were very bad hombres, very bad customers, a very warlike tribe who really made life miserable for other tribes, in particular for the Navajo. Uh, the, when the Spanish uh, were in the Southwest, the Utes basically formed a, a partnership with them. They uh, traded for horses, and in exchange, they traded Navajos for slaves. Uh, the Utes basically ran the Navajo out of what they considered to be their Garden of Eden in the San Luis Valley of, uh, of Colorado. So there's bad blood between those two tribes. The Utes believe, the Utes who live in the area around Skinwalker Ranch and in the Uinta Basin, believe that a curse was put on them, that the Navajo sent a skinwalker to punish them for all the bad things they'd done over the years. So they believe that this ranch is in the path of the skinwalker. So when we say in the book that we're looking, we're hunting for the skinwalker, we're not talking literally about trying to track down a shape-shifting uh, sorcerer. What we mean is that uh, the Utes, for whatever reason, use the skinwalker legend as sort of a blanket umbrella explanation for all the weird stuff that they'd been seeing at this particular property for as long as they could remember. Uh, we were told by the tribal police and tribal leaders that this property is off limits to the tribe. The, the reservation surrounds it. I mean, it's it's been there forever. They're not supposed to go there. They, they, they avoid it at all costs. At least that's what we were told. The uh, Gorman family, of course, had no way of knowing all this stuff before they moved in. Um, I'm, sure, I'm not sure they would have paid the same price for the property if they had known about it or whether they would have believed it, even if someone had warned them. In the 1994, they, they bought the property. They knew little about its history, except that it had been vacant for all those years. One thing they noticed, as I mentioned, uh, is all the, the stakes and, um, and the, the bolts. And then um, there's a whole lot of spectacular stuff that happened that we'll get to in a moment. The stuff that spooks me, that puts the goosebumps on my arms, are the little, little things that started happening. Um, what we might equate with like poltergeist type activity an extensive menu of just deeply disturbing things that, that that would happen on the property some of them outright dangerous but it's the little ones uh, that really got spooky and I'll, I'll give you some examples uh, inanimate objects showing up in odd places the frying pan being in the freezer and the things showing up in a microwave uh, the dad is out in the in the pasture and he's got a fence pole, fence post digger a heavy tool he, uh, he's digging holes to put fence posts in. He stops, it's leaning against him, or it leans against it, takes a swig of water, wipes his brow, turns around, it's gone. And they don't find it for three weeks. It was 75 feet up in a tree. Uh, mom goes to town. She goes shopping for groceries and it's a ranch family, so they get a lot of food. She uh, unloads all the stuff, puts it in the cupboards, uh, goes to the bathroom, comes back out, all the food's back in the bags. Um, or she goes to the bath and she takes a shower every morning. She goes in, she puts a, a towel and a hairbrush uh, on the cabinet. She locks the door, takes a shower, gets out. The door's still locked. Cabinet and hairbrush are gone. Stuff like that. Uh, they started seeing shapes, uh, odd shadows, things of that sort. Um, all, all around the property, they'd hear noises. They'd hear heavy footsteps. Uh, uh, outside their bedroom door in the, in the middle of the night, get up and there's nothing there. Uh, they started seeing these large, dark humanoid figures that would appear at their windows and then, and then later at the foot of their beds. Started hearing these disembodied voices, the speaking in a language they'd never heard. The husband and wife, the Gormans, are out in their yard one night. They tell the story. Uh, they hear these voices. It sounds like it's like 10 feet above their heads, speaking in something that's like Russian or Slavic or some language they'd never heard. And they yelled at them. Uh, they, you know, hey, we can hear you kind of a thing. And these voices were quiet for a second. And then they started sort of like mocking them, making fun of them. Um, and it, it became sort of a, a whole series of mind games. Everywhere the family was, they felt they were being watched. Everything they did, they felt that somebody was anticipating what they were going to do, that somebody could read their minds. 
Um, frequently, they heard these loud mechanical noises underground, almost like there was an underground railroad or a subterranean steel mill or something just shaking the ground at all hours of the night. Their neighbors would hear it as well and, uh, and had been hearing it for years. They saw a lot of weird animals, the wolf being one of them. Uh, the, the wife also had her own encounter with this horse-sized wolf out at the front gate. She came home one night, unlocked it, and there it was. Uh, it, it, its back was higher than the top of her car. And it was accompanied not by another wolf, but this gigantic dog, a gigantic black dog with a head that was too small for its body. I'm just weird stuff. Um, they started seeing these birds, exotic birds, red tropical birds that had never been seen in the area before. Um, like they belonged in the Amazon rainforest or something, uh, or maybe on their uh, on a stopover point to some, some other place. They, here's a weird one. Uh, one afternoon they're coming home. They see that their horses are jumping around in the corral are very upset. And uh, the rancher pulls up and jump, yeah. runs out thinking that a wolf or something to, or a dog is attacking the horses. And he sees this creature it's like a, almost like a hyena. It's uh, heavily muscled, very low to the ground, um, maybe 200 pounds, and it's slashing. It's got these big, long claws slashing at the, at the uh, legs of these horses, which are just in terror. Rancher screams at it. And, oh, the other thing it had was this great big bushy tail like a fox. Doesn't match any animal this guy had ever seen before. Um, so he goes yelling at it and running in the direction. This thing jumps out of the corral and, and runs up on the Skinwalker Ridge and then poof, I mean, literally disappears right before his eyes. By the way, the wolf, the, the wolf that they had seen, the bulletproof wolf, later after the NID scientists came to the property and started interviewing them about all the things they had seen, they gave him sort of like a canine lineup, like uh, pick out the suspect who did this thing. And they went through and looked at all these pictures of wolves and drawings of wolves. And the wolf that they found that most closely resembled the bulletproof wolf was something called a dire wolf. Uh, that's a species that has been extinct for 10,000 years. Um, lots of strange animals that would just show up. So after bulletproof wolves and assorted animals and mystery voices and strange lights and poltergeist type events, where does it go? Well, cue the UFOs. They started seeing them. First, it was little balls of light, white light, zipping in and out of uh, the trees. Then they started seeing these red things that would absolutely terrorize their animals. That would uh, drive the cattle, sometimes literally, off a cliff. Then they started seeing these things uh, that I call the blue meanies. They're like, uh, they were about the size of a softball, and they're, they look that the exterior looks like it's made out of glass, and inside, is this blue boiling, bubbling liquid. And these things uh, would literally inspire so much fear that they felt like falling to their knees. I mean, they, they were afraid of all kinds of stuff, but eventually they got used to some of these things. Uh, but these things, when they showed up, I mean, fear beyond anything that's rational, fear completely out of their mind. And it seemed like these things fed on it, that they, that they drew energy from it, that they just messed with their heads because it, it gave them, I don't know, a sense of power or maybe literally gave them power. Um, they saw a lot of flying discs. They saw sombrero-shaped objects that flew right into Skinwalker Ridge. They saw um, um, all kinds of lights day and night. They saw something that looked like an F-117 stealth fighter. It had Christmas lights like all around it and it would pop up on the property at night and, um, and shine a spotlight as if it was looking for things. Uh, at the same time that they sometimes would see these, uh, hear these underground noises, like the Underground Railroad, beams of light would light up the whole pasture. Sometimes they'd come from out of the sky. Sometimes it looked like they came from out of the ground. Well, you can imagine that the families get a little upset with this whole litany of activity, um, trying to figure out what the heck was going on. They saw these things that uh, they called orange orbs that looked like this, that, like a sun or like a moon. And uh, Tom Gorman had described this to the NIDS guys the first couple of times he saw it. He'd get his scope and, and sort of look at, look at these things as he'd see them in broad daylight. And he described it this way. He said, you look through those things, it's like you look into another sky, that there's a, a sky on the other side that is not day as it is here. It's nighttime. 
And on occasion, things would fly in and out of these orbs as if they're coming from some other reality into ours or leaving ours and going back to theirs. And I'm not making this up and neither was he. Um, the the uh, objects that they were seeing, they're, they're not fireflies, they're not strobe lights, they're not reflections from airplanes, they're not swamp gas. Uh, none of those kinds of explanations work. You know, it's, um, it, we don't have, um, and it was swamp gas. Have, it was swamp as gas. Far as we know any kind of blue orbs that can induce uh, emotional states or or terror in people, or uh, or that have no propulsion system other than some sort of a liquid. So uh, the mystery uh, continued to grow. They had some terrible incidents. Incidents. Um, uh, a, another UFO that made an occasional appearance on the property with this black uh, triangular thing, a smaller version of the F-117. Um, Mrs. Gorman, one night, her husband is, is away from town. He's on a business trip, and this thing follows her home. She's terrorized. She goes running in the house and uh, locks all the doors, peeks out and sees this thing, lights it. It's, it's, it's landed in the pasture right outside her bedroom window, and, um, and it's got this all this light spilling out. It's as if somebody opened a door, and then she watches as this really tall figure in what looks like a military uniform walks over to a desk in the middle of this room inside this craft, and it sits down there, and it's got this visor over, and it's just sort of sitting there watching her. Well, she's terrorized. She's calling her husband, get your ass home, man, and, uh, and trying to uh, get him there and get some help and locked all the doors and kind of hides and and uh, he got there by morning time and they went out into the pasture. This prop, this craft had been gone, but they found these great big, like size 14 boot prints uh, that they presumed had been left by the guy with the visor. Um, it, it goes on and on and on. Um, uh, Tom Gorman made a discovery in the third homestead. If you wanna let some pictures roll, um, it, it was scoop marks. 20, 30 scoop marks, hundreds of pounds of dirt just dug out of his property, kind of in a cookie cutter uh, pattern. How does somebody get in there with a backhoe or heavy equipment and take that much dirt? Look at that. Hearing? It's quiet out there at night. Yeah. Right? Uh, there's only one way in and one way out. It doesn't look like it's fresh either. Do it, but there they are. And even years no. later, you can still see uh, the impressions that were left. No, yeah, that's a good um, one. Really? Here's another incident that happened that was sort of uh, unsettling. As uh, I mean, yeah, one of our exposed rocks and other stuff underneath it. Filtering out. Tom would go into town and ask his neighbor, hey, somebody tell me about this stuff. And uh, he started hearing the stories. By the way, freeze on that for a time. We'll come back to that. Um, he started uh, hearing the stories that these things had been uh, around for a long time. And so the word sort of spread that some strange stuff was going on at the Gorman Ranch. And as it did, People would show up at the property. Uh, one in particular showed up and he uh, is yelling and honking his horn at the gate. Hey, I've got to get in there. I've got to get in to, to onto your property. I've driven hundreds of miles. I've been drawn here by some powerful force and I've got to meditate somewhere on your on your uh, pasture. And the rancher is kind of looking at his kid and they're laughing about it and everything and figure what the heck is this guy on? What's he been smoking? And um, they said, oh, what, what the heck? Get in our truck. You can come with us. They drive him up across their property, and they get to the middle homestead, which has often been uh, the scene of the most dramatic incidents that have been recorded there. And the guy says, stop, this is it. We got to get out here. And he jumps out of the truck. He says, this is where I'm going to meditate. He goes off into the pasture and puts his arms sort of this guy. And, and I don't know if he's chanting or humming or whatever the heck he's doing. And, and the rancher and his son are leaning on their truck, and they're kind of laughing about it. And they're laughing for just a minute, and they start hearing a noise. It sounds like a cowbell. Well, they don't have any cowbells on any of their cows. And the noise starts getting louder. And then they sort of, sort of see a figure moving in the tree line, in the shrub line. And it uh, is, is sort of heading toward this guy who's blissfully unaware of what's going on. His eyes are closed. And it's coming his way. And it, they could see, they, they identified it later as like the character in Predator. When he had that camouflage uniform on, it's all uh, opaque and uh, crystallized kind of a disguise. And this thing jumps out of the bushes and rushes up to this guy who still doesn't know it's coming and stops right in front of him. It's very tall and roars. And this roar 
they said could be heard for like miles. Well, this guy opened his eyes. He flies back, lands on his back. He's terror terrified. And this thing, this predator thing, goes back into the bushes and it disappeared. Uh, the rancher comes running over the guy and, hey, you all right, buddy? And uh, and the guy latches onto him and won't let go. Hey, you get, you're going to let go of me now. No, I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go of you to get out of here. You're going to let go of me or I'm going to pop you one. So he let him go with the promise that he would drive him off the property. He drove him off, and the guy turns around at the gate, and he just kind of screams this something to the effect of that, that this is satanic, the devil lives here, and, and uh, he put a curse on him kind of a thing. I, I will add one personal note uh, to that little story about where the predator was. In that same spot, there have been three mutilation cases, uh, a strange creature crawling out of a tunnel, and a lot of other really, really weird stuff. My first visit to the ranch, uh, the NIDS guys figure as well, the scientists, they figure, well, we've got a newcomer here. Let's, uh, let's give it a go. Uh, there were certain activities at the property that they learned sort of would generate uh, paranormal activity for some reason. Uh, the arrival of strangers, for one. Uh, you make a lot of noise out on, on the property, building a fire. And the, especially the thing that you could do is dig in the ground. And it's a strange uh, legend about the property because the, the original owners, the people who had previously owned it, had insisted that when Tom Gorman bought the property, that he signed a, a caveat that he could not dig in the ground without their prior permission. We'll come back to that one. Anyway, so I arrive on the ranch. I'm looking around. We're interviewing Colum. I got the cameraman with me, and I'm, I'm having a pretty good time. And they said, let's see if we can stir something up. So uh, we went out uh, and uh, built a big bonfire and made a bunch of noise. And then we got a big earth mover and dug things up. We figured if, if anything is here right now, that should, that should get its attention. And then they took me, which I didn't know this was coming. They Ooh. took me and put me on a little plastic chair out in the place where the predator had been. Ooh. And left me there. They had microphones on me and uh, a radio and a Geiger counter. Or a couple of things. I didn't even know what the heck it was or how it would operate. I just knew that they were going off somewhere either to drink beer and tell jokes and, and wait till someone something came and grabbed me, which was ha, 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 very funny. And I would like to tell you that I was very brave and I had no second thoughts about it. And I would have sat out there all night. Um, but that was not true. I mean, I was I was spooked about the whole thing. I've been hearing about the the ranch for a lot of years, and and something did come and get me, uh, mosquitoes. But uh, that was pretty much it. In fact, uh, all the times that I've been there, and I still go to Skinwalker Ranch a, a couple of times each year to check the place out. I've never seen squat, and uh, and unfortunately, Bob Bigelow, the guy who owns the the property, he hasn't seen squat. Pretty much everybody else who goes there sees it, except for he and I. Uh, so we both concluded that that the two of us either whatever it is doesn't want to meet us or we're a jinx or or something along those lines. Um, anyway, as as mentioned, uh, the, the ranch was sort of like this paranormal shopping list. It, it gets to the point where you you list all of it and it just sounds ridiculous. Well, Colin uh, Kelleher and I were writing the book. We had to make some really tough choices about the kinds of things that we could leave in and leave out because, man, there was a couple of them. We figured if I put this story in, uh, nobody's going to believe it. And I'll tell you what one of those stories is. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, these uh, the, the, the Native American police had told us this thing, that they had seen this coming around a the bend. They're on patrol duty in the area around the ranch. They come down this dirt road one night, and they see two, two figures, humanoid-looking figures, standing up uh, uh, with their backs to the road. It looked like they were smoking cigarettes. They had trench coats on. Smoking cigarettes, standing out on the road. These guys figure, what are these fellas up to? So they're pulling up, and they're they shining their lights on the guys, and they turn around, and they were dogs. <laughs> I know. They're dogs smoking cigarettes. I know you're what you're thinking. Why weren't they playing poker, too, or something like that? But um, the guys look at each other. They turn back around. The dogs, the cigarette-smoking dogs are gone. Uh, they, they get out of their vehicles, pull their guns, go over and look on the ground. There's the cigarettes. But the dogs, the trench coats, that's gone. Now, we had to think about whether we we're going to tell that story or not because it is just patently ridiculous. But since the book has come out, we've actually heard three different other accounts of cigarette smoking dogs um, wearing trench coats. So I, I don't know what, what force is playing that particular game on us, but... Uh, it's pretty darn weird. Um, 
there were sightings of what uh, the Native Americans would call Sasquatch. Uh, these things, seven, seven and a half feet tall all over the property. Some of them were chased by the police down in that property, uh, dark, running across the, 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 the pastures. There was some other kind of a large animal that was uh, seen many times all over the place. Well, actually not seen because it was invisible. You'd watch, you could see it move through the cattle. The animals would move, uh, scared, as if somebody just brushed them aside. On occasion, this thing would walk through water, the water, bodies of water that are on the property, and it, you could see the water being displaced. It was big. It was because uh, a lot of water was moving. You could hear it, but you couldn't see it. Uh, there was this musk odor that was often associated with uh, paranormal activity. When something strange was going to happen, they'd smell this this very powerful sulfuric smell before it happened. There were uh, circular impressions left on the grass, much like crop circles. Uh, three of them uh, each were eight feet in diameter, arranged sort of in a triangular pattern. Um, all of this was really taking its toll on the family, as you might imagine. The kids' grades were going down. The mom left lost her job at, at a bank in town. Uh, none of them were sleeping much. And, and then things got worse because bad things started happening to the animals. Very serious things. Um, you know, they live on a ranch. They've got a lot of animals, big, sturdy, hunting country dogs that aren't afraid of anything. Um, they refused to come out of their house for days at a time. They were scared about something. Um, several of these dogs just disappeared altogether. There was one night when eight of their cats disappeared. Um, I'll tell you about the cattle thing in a moment, but I'm, I'm going to jump ahead and tell you what happened to the three best hunting dogs. And maybe you've heard this story before. Uh, the rancher is on the phone to somebody I know at the time this happened. These three big dogs are chasing one of the blue meanies and is saying just outside the reach of their snapping jaws. And it's leading them across this pasture back toward where that wolf had originally been seen. And so the ranchers, hey, something's going on here. I'm going to have to get off the phone. And right about that point, the dogs went out of sight and went into the, to the brush line. And then he heard these screams or shrieked. And he was he's a very powerful, strong man, a world-class hunter. He's been in the country all his life. He was afraid to go out there. He went out there the next morning, and there were three greasy spots on the ground. And that was all left of his dog. Something just zapped him. Well, that was it. That was it. They were going to get the heck out of there and made the decision at that point, but they just didn't know at that point how they were going to do it. Um, let me tell you about the cattle. I told you that they lost 14 head. I told you about the bull incident in the, in the, um, into the trailer. Um, the NIDS team that you'll be hearing about more in a couple of minutes uh, was really uh, concentrated on cattle mutilation cases. They studied them all over the country all over North America and into Canada, when one of these cases would happen, they'd jump on it, get on a plane, go up there and see if they could get enough evidence uh, before it uh, it was destroyed by the element. So they had more than a few opportunities at the Skinwalker Ranch. This was one of the, after the team moved in, this incident happened. And I'm going to play, it's the other disc. It's the third one, yeah. This is sort of a, you know, I've been working on a documentary about the ranch ever since I've been going there for the last eight years now. And uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to get the darn thing done, but this is a chunk of what uh, one of the episodes could be about a particular uh, mutilation case that really messes with your mind. Not coyotes. When a family's entire livelihood depends on the well-being of its livestock, the loss of even a single animal is a serious matter. For the Gormans, the stakes were even higher. Their herd of 80 cattle consisted of high-end Semmental stock, each the product of Tom Gorman's expertise at artificial insemination. The loss of 14 valuable cows in a matter of months was devastating to the family's finances, but took a psychological toll as well. Across the country, dating back to the late 60s, hundreds of other ranchers in at least 15 other states experienced the same sense of frustration and helplessness upon discovering the grim evidence left behind by the mystery surgeons. At the Gorman Ranch, as elsewhere, the grisly handiwork was primarily carried out under the cover of darkness or during violent storms. The carved carcasses were mostly found hours or days later during daylight. 
even in sunlight, the discovery of an animal sliced up so precisely was chilling and deeply disturbing. And then it got worse. On March 10, 1997, Tom Gorman and his wife walked out of their home and into the pasture, planning to tag the ears of several calves that had been born in the preceding days. It was a bright, clear morning. Snow was on the ground. Fifty yards from their house, they found the first calf. As they were with their, their dog, uh, the, the two of them um, tagged and weighed this animal. They, they checked it at, I believe it was 84 pounds or 87 pounds. And they left the animal there with the, with the mother. Everything seemed to be fine, although they did detect an odor in the air around this uh, area. They, they, they detected a strong musk smell. Um, they took note of it, and then they headed west. And they went about 300 yards west beyond, the, the dog run was, is not, was not there at the time, but about 300 yards beyond um, towards where that incline is. Um, and they were tagging a second animal. Only 30 to 40 minutes had passed. The Gormans had an unobstructed view of everything in the field, but didn't see or hear anything unusual until their dog focused its attention back toward the house and the first calf. The dog with them down here at this stage began to act really strangely. It started growling, the hair on the back of its neck went up, and it started facing back towards here, growling and snarling. And then it just took off west, away from this spot. It just took off. It was never seen again. The Gormans were curious and walked back across the field. First thing they saw was the mother of the animal was running back and forth, kind of in a, in a, um, a sort of half circle from about this area to the fence line, just running back and forth. And it was limping. I mean, it was dragging its foot, it was limping. They met the animal um, and they noticed that it was just totally out of breath. It was panting. It was obviously in deep stress and it was dragging one leg. And then they noticed the calf or what was left of it. Spread eagled on the ground just about here with uh, it was it was lying with all four limbs just spread on the ground. All of its internal body cavity was gone. Um, it was completely Pretty well, all of its uh, muscle was gone from the, no blood. the torso. The legs were still intact, but the um, one of the ears was also gone. So they called NIDS. The rancher placed a call to the NIDS investigators who'd returned to Las Vegas for a rare weekend off. Within a few hours, a four-man team, including a veterinarian, was on the scene. Necropsy started. Now, the first thing that the veterinarian noticed during the necropsy was that the, the ear of the animal... You know, torture the animal, very sharp. get it scared as hell. Possibly a scalpel. Have its adrenal glands go ahead and uh, put adrenal comb into the entire blood system and then freaking drain all the blood. Yep. Yep. That's what they're after. That they and they drain it with no gone. spillage on the ground. So, uh, yep. The necropsy exactly. Which probably means it's done someplace else, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah. They drop them back. Forcibly ripped out of a ball and socket joint, which is extremely difficult to do. I mean, yeah, there's been strength. proof that uh, initially, insinuates that they may have been dropped from a high height. Laying weight yeah. for this animal, losing a bunch of pounds of meat mm -hmm. in 45 minutes, which we don't know of any predator that could have done that. And how could a predator inflict such carnage without being seen or heard by the rancher, his wife, or his dog, who are a few hundred yards away in the same field on what was a quiet Sunday morning. No four-legged predator known to science could do it. The team gathered tissue and bone samples, which were sent to three independent pathology labs. The results arrived later, but confirmed what seemed obvious in the pasture that day. The calf had been carved up by someone wielding sharp metallic instruments. A heavy machete-like object had slammed into the bones. A smaller scalpel-like knife had sliced the hide and muscle. Closer inspection revealed that it was definitely sharp instruments used. There was no sign of blood. There was no sign of entrails around. It was perfectly clean. Uh, not a drop of blood on the grass. We went even as far as doing an experiment by pouring blood on the grass to see how fast it would seep through. We videotaped the grass and showed, you know, even two days later. You could I'm sure. Days, I'm sure. There was no blood whatsoever, not a single drop either underneath the animal on the animal or on the grass. It was just completely clean. 
A professional tracker was brought in. He scoured every inch of ground in and around the field, looking for tracks, human, animal, or vehicle. Nothing. Eventually, the investigators reached an unsettling conclusion. The bottom line is this animal must have been killed elsewhere because right, there's no blood. Exactly. There was no blood on the scene, and then the animal must have been brought back, laid down carefully, almost, you know, really almost ritually on the spot where it had been tagged. It's 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. The rancher and his wife are out there on the, on the pasture. You can see what those meadows look like. I mean, it's quiet out there. They're 50 yards away from their house when they tag this calf. And then they're 100 or so yards away. If somebody had come in, if humans, if uh, Delta Force or something like that had come in and snatched that calf up and cut it up there, they would have heard it. If a predator had done it, they would have heard it. Something did it uh, as if snatching it up taking it somewhere else and then dropping it back in a way that uh, the ranchers uh, didn't see or hear anything. But it's, it's just strange. You know, you, you hear people, the skeptics who explain the uh, cattle mutilations away as uh, it's devil worshipers or it's uh, coyotes or it's magpies. Magpies didn't do that one. Um, and I'll tell you the analog to this part of the story is that, uh, that this was just about at the breaking point for the rancher. That was his last loss. He was financially close to the to close to ruin, um, even though the NIDS guys were there helping him out. And, and the next day, you know, they're all kind of on edge. Again, the animals, the dogs, the other dogs that he had got, they, they got a bunch of dogs from the shelter, by the way, to use as sort of like biosensors. If you saw that, that compound um, that was in an earlier picture there, they'd have them out there to let them know that something was coming and, and to use almost as bait, uh, although none of them were ever harmed. Uh, so the dogs are spooked, all the animals are spooked, the people are spooked. Uh, this, this Obviously, there's something big that had just uh, 75 pounds or 60 pounds of meat. Uh, what, what Column didn't say in that soundbite is in addition to them finding evidence of a scalpel-like instrument and a heavy machete instrument, there were teeth marks that something had chewed on that calf. Wow. Um, they didn't yeah. identify the teeth marks, though. So something is out there. Everybody's on edge. It's nighttime, and the rancher, you know, we have a, actually have a piece of this video. Remember the late night cow video that you had up there for a minute, I think, from tape number one? Eh, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, I'll tell the story. Um, anyway, so the rancher hears a noise. He hears his cattle out. It's a nighttime, and he, he's patrolling around because he doesn't want to lose any more. He's got a, a powerful gun with him in his truck. Um, the NIDS guys uh, hear him making a noise, tearing out across the pasture. So they jump in their vehicle, and they go after him, and they bring in a video camera. And then they hear him jump out of his truck. Boom, I got it. The story was, as he explained what he had said, and then did sh more shots. He had pulled up to this tree and had seen these two creatures. One is a big, round, almost looks like a bear. It's at the bottom of this tree. And the other one is up in a tree. Now, he can't see the shape of that creature in the tree, but he knows it's big because its eyes were like this. Big, green, reptilian eyes, that big, sitting up in the tree, glaring at him. Uh, and he shot at that, too. And as soon as he shot the thing at the bottom, which is the first thing that he hit, he says, I hit it. It goes, poof, it's gone. He shoots this thing in the, the eyes in the tree, the second thing, and it fell out. Now, there was snow on the ground. There was still snow at the time. And the NIDS guys come up behind uh, Tom Gorman, rushing to catch him because he goes off into the brush. But this thing fell down, and one print is in the snow uh, at the bottom of that tree. And they analyzed it later, and it's tough to do because it is snow. It, they couldn't make a cast of it, but it was like a raptor, like a dinosaur. Um, that's the only thing that the only kind of comparison they could make. And crazy as it sounds, after shooting it out of the tree, they go into the bushes looking for it. Didn't find it. No blood. They brought in the, the same guy who was the tracker, went looking for it, never found it. But um, just sort of adding to the litany. Now, the neighbor, you saw the picture of the neighbor who was driving down the road there, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, had his own mutilation incidents. So it's not just the Gorman family making this stuff up. One of the most unusual ones was he had a couple of cows in a, in a barbed wire fenced area. They can't get out. I don't know why he was keeping them there, but he looks out his window 
and damn if they aren't out. One of them is caught under the barbed wire. The other one is out in the in the field laying down. He goes out there and sees it, and his two front legs are broken. He can't figure out for the life of him how it got out of the uh, in the enclosure and what had happened to its leg. So he goes back in the house. He's going to get a gun and a blanket uh, to comfort the didn't know whether to comfort the cow who was in agony or to shoot it and put it out of its misery. Comes right back outside, cow's gone. It's gone. Scratching his head, goes back in the house trying to figure out what the heck had happened. He uh, has a sandwich, it's an hour later, he looks out his window and to his amazement, the cow's back. He goes running outside. Now, instead of two broken legs, it has four broken legs. It is as if it had been dropped from the sky twice. Uh, there were a lot of those kinds of incidents, both to the Gormans and to their neighbors. And that is sort of why NIDS got involved. And I'll, I'll make this short because I know you're going to have questions on this and other topics. But um, um, NIDS, the National Institute for Discovery Science, heard about this because Tom Gorman got fed up. He thought it was the military pulling tricks. That somehow the military wanted his land and they're playing mind games with him. So he went to a newspaper reporter and he told told the reporter about it, thinking if I get enough publicity, maybe they'll leave me alone. Well, what happened instead was Bob Bigelow heard about it. He flies down to meet with Gorman. Uh, by the time that the Bigelow and the NIDS people arrived on the property, the Gorman family, the four members, were all sleeping in the same room every night on the floor for safety. They were a wreck. Um, they had some instances that, that sort of coincide with uh, what we, we would describe as alien abduction experiences, scars and missing time and things like that. I mean, they were a wreck. So Bigelow, in a sense, was sort of a savior to them. He says, hey, can I buy the ranch? Yeah, you bet you could buy this ranch. And then he talked Tom Gorman into what would seem impossible, and that is staying on. The family were to move to another property 20 miles away, but Tom Gorman, who was a proud man, stubborn, didn't want to be run off his land, was determined to get to the bottom of it. And many a night he would be out there on his property with a gun trying to outwit whatever the heck this intelligence was. And eventually he sort of developed sort of a strategy for stalking it and, and felt that at times he could avoid it, uh, even though other times it seemed to know exactly what he was going to do, what he was thinking, what he was planning. That's also the experience that the NIDS guys had. They arrive on the property, they come in with uh, sort of guns blazing. Um, there was a lot of debate among the science advisory board about what kind of an approach to take with such a unique property and a unique position. Uh, they opted to go high tech. So they put cameras all over the property and sensors and uh, they installed a trailer with all kinds of infrared gear and other things. They had a 24 hour a day uh, presence on the property and they did what scientists should do. I mean, basic science. Some one of the criticisms we've had of the book is, well, where the heck is the science? Well, you got to look for it. What these guys did was look, let's look for explanations for all this stuff. They did a geomagnetic survey of the property to see if there was some kind of a gra gravity anomaly that would cause any of this stuff happening earth lights, that kind of stuff. They sampled uh, every plant that they, every plant species to see if like there's magic mushrooms or something growing on the property, inspiring all these visions, nothing like that. They eliminated a lot of possibilities. They talked to all the neighbors. They cast an ever widening net, uh, talking to local officials, to shopkeepers, to uh, all the people who lived in the surrounding towns who had UFO incidents, people like Junior Hicks and Gonzalez next door. They did basic investigative work trying to get a handle on what this thing was. And then they started seeing the stuff themselves, uh, the lights, uh, the orbs, and a lot of other strange, uh, strange things. There was an incident where uh, a PhD physicist who has worked on classified programs uh, for uh, several um, military uh, entities and, and intelligence agencies is out there on the property with uh, my friend, Col Dr. Colm Kelleher. And they see this black thing in the in the in the trees, kind of an amorphous cloud, and it's kind of circling them in a in a menacing sort of way. The dogs that are with them are terrified, and then it, and then this guy, this physicist, starts speaking in another voice that this thing had gone into his head, and it's telling Column, "We're watching you. You're not welcome here." 
And this guy, the physicist, doesn't remember exactly that happening, but for days later, this thing sort of hung with him um, and, and sort of terrorized him in other locations on the property. These are, these are world-class guys who saw this stuff. They had an incident where they're, they got two guys up on, on Skinwalker Ridge who are sort of watching with infrared and, and telescopes, and then two other guys are down below. And the guys who are below see this, like a, a dirty snowball of yellow light hanging maybe a foot off the ground in the middle pasture, you know, George plastic chair pasture. Um, and it's getting bigger and bigger. And they're talking on the walkie talkie to the guys upstairs. And they said uh, up at the, on the ridge. And they say, can you see this thing? Yeah, we're watching it. And this ball starts getting bigger and then it kind of gets elongated until it looks like a tunnel. And you guys still watching this? Yeah. And the guys with the infrared said, Hey, there's something inside this thing. And sure enough, this large humanoid looking creature starts wriggling through the tunnel from one side, trying to get to the other as if it's coming from somewhere else. And it gets to the end of the, this uh, tunnel of light. It stands up. It's like eight feet tall, uh, black featureless. And uh, it jumps out the tunnel collapses on itself and goes away. And this thing, this big thing starts running up Skinwalker Ridge. The guys are up there just about had to, had to change their underwear because they're, they're thinking it's coming up after them. And it didn't, um, it just went poof. I mean, they, these guys are, didn't make this stuff up. I mean, they had these experiences themselves. And again, as with the Gormans, um, this, this entity, this intelligence played with them. It's like it anticipated their moves. You put some cameras, so it's going to watch here. You have an event over there. You put it over there, it happens over there. They had, uh, they developed a, uh, almost tried to develop a communication system with the thing and felt that at one point that they were close to it, but it didn't happen. And eventually uh, they started adopting the techniques that Tom Gorman had used. And they're stalking it. And whatever this intelligence was, it didn't like being hunted. It liked being the hunter. Yeah. And uh, and it started appearing less and less and less and it sort of punctuated its departure in, in a very distinct way. You saw the picture of the telephone pole with the cameras on top. Um, anyway, there's they've got three of these cameras on, on poles looking at different parts of the, of the ranch property. And one night they noticed that one of the cameras went out completely and they go out mm -hmm. to investigate and something had gone up the pole and ripped the guts out of this camera and not just ripped the wires out, just destroyed it. But they had had this thick uh, tape all the way down the telephone pole. The tape had been baked in the sun and the hot summer sun out there. Yeah, that's that's uh, what the camera set up. And uh, that's you see the tape. So they had ripped the tape off. That was gone. The, uh, the tubing that protects the wires that go up the top, that was gone. And they thought, aha, you know what? We've got the other camera that has a vision that, that should be able to see what happened there. We'll just back time it. We'll take a look and, and see what it was or who went up there and destroyed this camera. They rolled the tape back. They can't see anything. Nothing. There's nothing there. Right? It, it, there we the go. It's not crisp enough to see the wires flying or anything, but uh, there's nothing there. They take the, the videotape back to Las Vegas and later could see a tiny little almost like a firefly or something flying around it. But this was no firefly. It was as if this thing said, we don't want your cameras here anymore and we don't want you here anymore. And uh, eventually the level of activity sort of dropped off to the point where there wasn't enough for these guys to be there to study. Uh, it flares up. And Alexander uh, and everybody else. Now and then, not only around the ranch, but throughout the Uinta Basin. Um, but this is, sort of a, this is sort of a mystery we're not going to solve anytime soon. I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but I mean, it seems like it was a portal of some sort or a dimensional door or mm -hmm. we're coming in from somewhere else. You know, in exactly. for the book, uh, we analyzed a variety of different possibilities of what it could be. We we ruled out hoaxes because the, the family didn't create this story. It had been there since long before they lived in the area, since before they were born. Uh, they didn't. Uh, instilled the story in their neighbors. Everybody in the whole region had seen these kinds of weird things. They didn't destroy their own animals. They didn't uh, hoax the, the NIDS guys who saw this stuff with their own eyes. Plus, they were they were trustworthy people. They were s solid, salt-of-the-earth kind of yeah. people. 
completely. The other possibility, an ET possibility, I guess so. You know, we can't rule it out. We don't know enough about ETs to say whether this is what they do or not. It just doesn't seem to be consistent with what you and I know about ET or alleged ET behavior. It's something more. Terry, well, we can't really rule that out entirely. I, I suppose the military could pull some of this stuff off. I know they would like to have technology like this. We know that they have played psychological games with, with people in isolated areas before, probably with a much larger public. But I'm left asking myself, which is the Delta Force commando who gets the order to sneak hmm. into the bathroom and steal a hairbrush without, you know, while the ladies <laughs> get a shower? Right. Um, too All much does not match uh, the capabilities, at least known capabilities, of our military. And so, you know, that sort of leaves uh, only one possibility that we kind of kicked around, and that's the, a dimensional, uh, parallel universe, alternate reality, something. Yeah. Uh, too many instances where it appeared that we were getting glimpses of other realities. Uh, you know, the orange balls where things would come in and out, this tunnel where something came from somewhere else, these animals that we had never seen before that would wander through. Uh, there were there were other things. Um, during uh, duck season or goose season, these big formations of the geese would fly over the house and right over the house, you know, they're in this perfect V, boom! It's like they run into an invisible portal or, or a, a tower or something like that. Magnetic okay. disturbance. Something really strange about that property. Absolutely. Don't know what it is. Or a cloaked uh, ship. Don't know that we'll ever know what it is. But yeah, to, but you got to remember, geese are following the magnetic right sensor in their nose. But it just their beak. like it's They're flying along. Leading us down. If they hit something, it screws right that up. It's a, another it's way to, to think about things, to analyze uh, what the world is really like. Um, and you know, I, I can't answer it. I, I, I don't, uh, I don't, my brain isn't big enough to figure it out, but it, it just looks like it's, uh, it's leading us toward an understanding of a, of a bigger and more mysterious world. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but we, we took a lot of grief over this, you know, um, that this is a waste of science, the time of scientists and journalists to pursue these kinds of crazy topics. And, and I don't feel that way at all, you know, in, uh, in my uh, years, what's of, a waste of science? Of faithful, I've uh, observed the, the nuts and bolts, uh, right. saucer aficionados. That you know, they don't they don't like the abductees, and and ufology in general is is despised by the poltergeist crowd, and and the Bigfoot folks have nothing but contempt for all the above. You know, uh, <laughs> but it just might be so true. Putting all of these different para, paranormal phenomena in one place is a way of telling us that some level, maybe they're connected. And, right. and maybe someday you uh, dumb humans are going to be able to figure it out. And that, uh, you know, what we call paranormal today might be normal once we understand the, the big picture, assuming that we ever will. You know, the, the distance is growing between uh, the rigid uh, dogma of modern science and the everyday experience of regular people all over the world who see strange things, uh, who see things, things happen. Uh, they try to tell a scientist that a scientist won't investigate it because it's beneath their dignity to give any credence to it. And that shouldn't be how it works. You know, scientists are the guys who get their hands dirty, who aren't supposed to worry so much about um, their grants or their peers or their, their next job or something like that, but who follow the information and the evidence wherever it leads. Uh, people who are supposed to be willing to look at the world in a different way so we can understand it. You know, people like the ones at NIDS who did this stuff, who put their lives on the line, their professional careers. Uh, it wasn't a perfect study. Uh, there are different approaches that could have been taken, but this is what scientists, science is supposed to do, and, and journalists too. And that is to investigate the unexplained and not explain the uninvestigated. And I'll take your questions if you want. Okay. So, uh, what did you think of that, Tommy? Well, the Skinwalker Ranch, I mean, it's been around forever. The stories have been around forever. There's just so much going on there. Um, so many different people with so many different stories, but they're all sort of similar. Um, and it's just amazing to me that um, 
Well, finally, we've got somebody out there that's willing to do some real investigative work, some real scientific uh, investigation, things of that nature, to figure out exactly what the hell is going on there. Because clearly something is. I don't believe that family's lying. There have been families before yeah. them. I don't believe that the native people of the area were lying. I mean, it, come on, there's just more going on there than meets the eye. And I think it's way, way deeper than government involvement, personally. Uh, yeah, I don't think the government may, <clears throat> maybe the government's been involved for about the last, what, 80, 90 years. But outside of that, I think uh, the history of the area goes back even more than 200 years mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, in tribal history and has been handed down word, word to mouth uh, through the tribes. And then it, uh, um, somebody built a ranch there and boom. Yeah, you gotta remember the thing is 480 acres in size. It's freaking huge. It's not small. Yeah, 480. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty big. Um, and it's all flat except for the ridge. Mm -hmm. So that ridge is kind of like a, an outlook. And like we were discussing before the stream, we thought maybe that ridge had geomagnetic properties. Okay. And that, that may have been the reason why it was glowing at night and causing that beam of light to go up into the sky. But what I wonder is, is why was there only one beam and in one location? Yeah, something was creating the beam more than yeah. just the magnetic properties of the, th of the of the actual location. But if you have something that's going up, there's got to be something there that's creating it. And there's got to be a reason that it's doing it. It's not just like setting off a freaking you know, light up into the sky like it's a cell at freaking Kmart or something. Come and, find me. Come find me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they're, they're doing it for a reason. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think we presented a lot of interesting evidence to this evening in regards to the skinwalker ranch the the fact that thomas had some information that wasn't reported by george knapp yeah is very interesting in itself i mean with the creature crawling out of the portal and running off into the woods i mean that that does verify the dog story yeah. by mr tommy highway and and by george knapp as well who yeah. also repeated the story in the video Right. So um, we want to thank everybody in the uh, chat room for responding and asking questions and answering our voting system that Thomas put up. And it was very, very good tonight. Yeah. And um, next week, uh, we are going to present another very interesting subject. Hasn't been decided yet. I have to get together with these guys and have a band meeting and figure something out. But We'll, we'll be sure to try and entertain you. Ugh, can't talk. Entertain you. Any last comments, Tommy? Well, as always, folks, thanks for coming out. We really appreciate it. I think it was a great show tonight, very informative. I'm a huge George Knapp fan. Uh, as many of you probably already know, that George Knapp was the guy that actually broke the Bob Lazar story back in 89. So and he's been just like the head UFO uh, journalist ever since. I uh, really respect the guy. really like him a lot. Uh, he does his homework. And pretty much, I think he's solid. I think that he can be believed, whereas a lot of uh, other people are out there, a lot of other journalists are out there just for the limelight. I think this guy really believes in the cause. I really do. Yeah, I find him I find him extremely credible as well. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, I was about to say our fans out there on the chat room are saying, well, we're going to watch a video, talk some stuff, and it's over already? <laughs> well, um, you always go back and rewatch it, folks. Oh, there. Yeah, we can always have you go back and rewatch it. I mean, it was almost an hour and a half. Um, um, yeah, I'm sorry that it's over already, but um, yeah, uh, we're going to come back with a better and bigger show next week. So I hope you can attend. And we want to thank everybody in the chat. Yeah. And here we go. Mm -hmm.